All right, everyone. Welcome back to our second talk of the annual open house. I'm really pleased to introduce Carl Mayling, who's a senior museum specialist at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. He's been at the American Museum since 1990 when he began volunteering in various departments. And his work at the, at the museum now includes fossil collecting, identification, care, and organization. He enjoys studying all kinds of fossils and travels all over the world to co collect and write about them. And I'm really pleased that he's here with us today to share some of that information. And he's going to take us on the long road from the Carboniferous after 87 years, mysterious fossil tracks being rediscovered. So Carl, welcome, thank you, and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks for that introduction, Kathleen, and thank you all for joining. This is the traditional part of the talk where the audience is thanked for coming out in some horrible weather, um, but I'm gonna thank you guys for all staying at home and staying away from me and staying safe, um, especially where it's really, really cold in New York and New Jersey right now, if those, that's where you're viewing from. <clears throat> so I've been in the Department of Paleontology for a really long time and the museum being such a really old institution and having such a vast fossil collection, I often have the opportunity to work with things that haven't been fully processed for many, many decades. And that's what we're going to talk about here. Um, it's a, a, a bunch of uh, Carboniferous fossils from Alabama, vertebrate and invertebrate. Um, that are really, really exciting. But before we do that, we're gonna have to take a short detour to Wyoming. Um, this is our dig. Our, it's been an annual dig since 2016, but we're, 2020 was a bust for obvious reasons. Um, it's in the late Jurassic Morrison formation and primarily we're digging dinosaurs. So going through the pictures left to right, the first one, I'm holding a tailbone of an Allosaurus. Um, the next picture is the team finishing up a big plaster jacket with a partial skeleton of a baby apatosaurus. The next picture is a claw bone of a, meat, a small meat-eating dinosaur. And small dinosaurs are always more exciting because they're much harder to preserve. And this one is, there's probably more of it still in the ground, so we're anxious to get back out there and finish digging that up. And the gif on the right is the team burying the site at the end of the season. Um, because we work on government land, that's that's who permits us to dig there. And it's a stipulation that we bury the site um, to protect it from weathering um, when we're not there, but also poachers. Um, and in the end of that season, you know, when we were wrapping up and, and I had some free time, I ordered this book online, Footprints in Stone. I was vaguely aware that something really exciting was going on with Carboniferous Footprints in Alabama. And I picked this book up because I like uh, the fringe areas of paleontology that don't get a lot of um, attention. Uh, but also footprints are, are pretty exciting. Um, if you think about it, when, when you're looking at a fossil skeleton, you're looking at a record of a dead thing. But when you're looking at fossil footprints, you're looking at a record of a living thing. It was alive when it made those marks in the stone. So they have a, a completely different flavor. Um, but before we go on to Alabama, we're gonna have to go back to Wyoming very briefly again. This is Barnum Brown. He was one of our curators for many decades in the Department of uh, Paleontology. He worked primarily on dinosaurs, but collected uh, vertebrate fossils all around the world. Um, he was such a good promoter of paleontology that he even had sort of a public persona um, in the news and was nicknamed Mr. Bones. He's the discoverer of the first T-Rex skeleton, which, which solidifies his name um, pretty pretty well in the public eye to this day. And he's often considered the greatest fossil collector, sorry, dinosaur collector of all time. And although that's pretty hard to quantify and, and verify against other collectors, if you walk around the exhibits on the fourth floor of our museum, most of those skeletons that are mounted were collected by him and it's just a small fragment of fra a fraction of what he collected. So it's probably true. By time, he started the Hal Quarry dig in Wyoming in 1934. He'd been digging dinosaurs for a really long time and had seen an awful lot of um, specimens come out of the ground. And yet he was blown away when he saw Hal Quarry because the, the abundance of the bones and the preservation was unlike anything he'd ever seen. On the left, he's holding um, a partially jacketed 
rib of a sauropod dinosaur and there's other bones on, on the ground in front of him that are partially jacketed and they have their field numbers on them. And on the right, you can get a sense of how um, densely packed this, the quarry was. This is a aerial photograph, not done by a drone because this is 1934. They hoisted the photographer in a bucket hanging from a hay derrick so he could shoot the, the quarry from above. And it's probably really hard to see, but there are thin white lines crisscrossing the quarry. And those are strings that were laid out in a grid um, to document what, what was in there. And basically what was created was this map um, drawn by R.T. Bird. Um, this was his very first dinosaur dig. And this was his introduction to the, the work he would be doing for the museum for the next couple of years. It was a hell of a way to start. You can see on the right how densely packed the bones are and how complicated a dig this must have been. Um, Ironically, this map is probably, until very recently, the most important thing that was produced out of the Haukari material. Because this was 1934, the, you know, digging was, was, was hit pretty hard by the Depression, but then the 40s introduced the, uh, World War II, which continued, you know, making things hard for large excavations, but also that's when Barnum Brown stepped down as curator. So the focus on this, the material he was working on shifted at that point. So when I took this job and when I started this particular position in 2003, I was very aware of the How Quarry material and its story. And, and, it, and it was, it's very romantic and very exciting. And I knew that a lot of the material was still in crates in storage in unfortunately a room that was alternately very wet and dry or very hot and cold or cold. And uh, there were a lot of pests in there and, and rats had gotten into a lot of the crates and set up shop and lived their entire lives in the crates. So on the left are four pictures of one of the crates and you can see there's a lot of wood damage on the, the front of it. Um, that's just rot from being in a, in a poor environment. But most of the, the crates had a box number written on them and a year, 1934, that happens to be the only dig we did, the only dinosaur we did, the dig we did in 1934 was how quarry. So that was pretty clear. And it's hard to see on the, at the top of this crate, but it says American Museum of Natural History, New York. So they were very clearly marked on the outside. And the inside of each crate had plaster wrapped dinosaur bones with the field numbers relating to the grid written right on them. And some of them were even bone shaped. So it was very, very obvious when you opened up a how quarry crate, what you had. But one crate that I opened in April of 2005 was completely different. It was constructed different in a different shape from the general crates from Hal Quarry. It had no marks on the outside, no year, no indication of where it was from or what was inside. And inside there were no plaster jackets and no dinosaur bones. There were gray flat slabs of uh, uh, shale. Um, with uh, tiny tetrapod footprints in it. At least that's what I could see when I first opened the crate. There were a few tattered bits of burlap that offered negligible protection for the specimens inside and they were damaged uh, partly because of the poor packaging. And there were some bits of newspaper that were thrown in for who knows what reason. But you can see this, this slab on the top, it starts at one end of the crate and extends all the way to the other end of the crate. And we're going to revisit that um, slab quite a bit in a, in a little bit. So when you when you open up a crate that has such little of so so little of its story um, obvious, you, you have to be very, very careful and protect everything in there that could be of value in determining what the contents mean. So newspapers are very important because they often have a date on them if you have the, the right portion of the newspaper. They often have a place um, that uh, may be connected to the origin of the dig. But also newspaper is only ever used when it's fresh. It very quickly becomes yellow and brittle. So it's not useful very, very soon after it's, it's uh, fresh. But also it's not a, a resource that's hard to get. So there's no reason to stockpile it. And because of that, you can generally trust the dates to be pretty close to the time that the, the newspaper was, was put into the crate or was used for whatever it was used for. Um, the, on the uh, slabs themselves, a lot of them had these AM and H numbers, AM and H2 here, AM and H6. And it looks like 
our one of our catalog numbers, the way it's written. I checked in the catalog and these are clearly not AMH two and six. So these represent field numbers of some kind. And those could become vital later in, in determining what this material is. So any fragments, even if the rest of the slab was destroyed, those fragments of numbers were uh, protected. And then there was this piece, which is blown up on the right. Um, and it is a, a, a fossil stem of a plant called Calamites, which is extremely common in the Carboniferous. So what I was beginning with were tetrapod tracks, probably collected in the 30s, probably Carboniferous. Um, it wasn't a lot to go on, uh, but that was that was my beginning point. I had shown the material over the years to various people who work on footprints, and they they had no idea what they were, unfortunately. The other thing you want to do, because there was a lot of damage in the crates, there were a lot of fragments that um, needed to be reassociated with their other fragments. So this piece um, is one slab very very thin very very fragile and it was found in multiple pieces that i was able to gather up and and reassemble and if you i don't know if you can see it clearly but there's a footprint here there's one here and there's one here so there's a trackway moving across the bottom of the original slab which meant i didn't need to save all the pieces on the top i determined there were no marks on them so they were discarded um, because we always have to be mindful of how much space we have in the collections and we're always trying to um, put in only what's what's very useful. <clears throat> this is a shot of one of the the large slabs that came out of the crate. Um, it's about two inches thick and it has some big cracks in it, but the damage isn't very serious. Uh, you can see by my glove on the right how big the slab is. And right across the top of it is a gorgeous trackway of an early tetrapod. Um, a little bit about how footprints are preserved so you can uh, get a better sense of uh, what I'm showing you. An animal will walk on a surface that that takes the impression of their feet, the footprints. So, you know, imagine mud. Mud is generally the, the substance we're talking about. Um, so there are impressions in that surface that are later covered over with another layer of sediment that buries them. And when you split these rocks, if the crack breaks on the, the surface the animal walked on, you have one side with impressions and a mirror image with the sediment that filled in those impressions. So you get two for one sort of. Um, but another thing that happens is um, these animals are walking on layered sediment often and the pressure of their feet or, or their feet puncturing the, the surface of the, the sediment can leave footprints or marks underneath the surface they're standing on. We call them ghost tracks or underprints. And it turns out a lot of the tracks in this collection were under tracks. It's not the exact surface the animal walked on, but it's deformations in the sediment just below the surface. And if you think about it like that, they're buried the second the animal walks away because they're in effect already underground. And in, in some ways they're easier to preserve if they're already in the ground like that. So back to Footprints in Stone, this book. Um, as soon as I started reading it in the preface, I came across this sentence. American Museum of Natural History paleontologist George Gaylord Simpson even worked to secure specimens for his institution back in New York City. So this was obviously thrilling because I had already flipped through the book and seen all the pictures and the, the type of stone and the type of tracks were identical to this the material in the mystery crate. So this is the first solid connection I had to a place. And I knew that what I was looking at was almost certainly from Alabama. Very exciting. But that was 12 years after opening the crate when I got my first clue of, of what I was dealing with. So who's George Gaylord Simpson? He was another curator in um, our department in paleontology. He worked on fossil mammals. Um, he's often considered the most influential paleontologist of the 20th century. And that's basically because he was a modernizer of evolutionary theory. What he did was he gathered all the previous research on evolution up until his time in the, this is in the 40s when he when he did this synthesis and he combined it all into a more rigorous um, methodology for for understanding paleontology. And for that, he's he's recognized as one of the greats. So now that I had him cornered, I wanted to see if he had written anything about this trip to Alabama and, and if, if I could illuminate the specimens in the box, the crate. And all I came up with was this book, Simple Curiosity, which is a collection of letters from him to his family. 
and all that was in there was a portion of a letter that said, a day spent weirdly and unsupported by the solace of tobacco in the depths of a coal mine looking for footprints of animals dead since 250 million years BC. Um, great, it's another connection with Simpson and this crate, but it's not um, enough to, to really, you know, it's not data really that we're looking for. It's just another suggestive connection. So I went back and looked at what was in the crate that I rescued aside from the specimens themselves. And again, I have these newspapers. Um, this, oh, I meant to say um, in the introduction of the book, it went on further to say that Simpson was down there in 1930. So now I had a place, a time and a, and a, a name to attach to the crates. <clears throat> so this newspaper is December 1930. That was very nice to have that connection because that's what I was hoping for. The fact that this newspaper comes from Boston is still problematic. That doesn't make any sense with the flow of the story. But this scrap of newspaper, this is two sides of the same sheet. It, I did have the date preserved or part of the date, the year 1931. And this is a newspaper out of Memphis. So at least I was in the South and in the right time frame. So that was very useful and, and encouraging. And again, I had written on the stones these field numbers, which I had hoped would would um, explain themselves later. The next thing I did was I contacted our archivist and I asked her if she could see if there was anything in the archives relating to a trip Simpson took to Alabama to collect fossil, fossil trackways in 1930. <clears throat> and she came up with a few things not too uh, not too soon after I asked. The first one is a, the one on the left is a, a telegram from Brown to Simpson saying he should contact the head of the mine in Alabama before he arrived. The second one was a letter uh, saying that he should try to get, you know, as many big slabs with beautiful footprints as he could for the collections because I think Brown was very interested in putting them on display. And on the right was an itinerary of uh, Simpson's wandering trip <clears throat> excuse me, through the south. And down here on January 17th and 18th, it says Carbon Hill, Alabama, uh, Pennsylvanian footprints, which was very exciting. Um, but the, you know, this still wasn't, this was all suggestive that there was a connection between the crate and Simpson, but it wasn't really enough. Uh, it, it, it didn't unlock the full story for me. But then as often happens, the archivist in her final sweep of the archives hit the jackpot. Oops, something's wrong with my slide advance. Oh, there it is. Um, and she found this folder called Carbon Hill, Alabama Fossil Tracks. And this was really thrilling because it was a, a portion of a conversation, a correspondence uh, between the AMNH and various people in Alabama discussing the acquisition and the trade for these fossils. Um, and the best thing that was in there was an itemized list of everything that Simpson had chosen for the American Museum of Natural History. And it had descriptions of all the specimens and they were matching the, the field numbers that I had on the specimens in, in the rescued material. There was one anomaly though, specimen 1A was listed as a slab seven feet long. And if you remember the crate um, photograph that I showed you in the beginning, that one slab that extends from end to end in the crate is about five feet long. So there's no real way a seven foot slab could have been in that crate. Um, and no, no evidence has shown up that this is anywhere in the collection. So this, the whereabouts of this slab at least are still a mystery to us. So a little bit about the, the fossils themselves and the context of the paleo we're talking about. This is the Pennsylvanian period, about 320 million years ago uh, from which these fossils come. It's the Pottsville formation of the Black Warrior Basin. And the basin was an embayment of the, the seaway on the surface of the continent that went into the northern part of Mississippi and Alabama. You, I hope you can see the border here. Um, and the fossil swamps that produced the tracks and the fossil plants is on the east shore of that waterway, the, that basin. The trackways were first discovered in Alabama in the 20s, very, very short, a very short time before Simpson got there. But very little work was done beyond an initial paper describing some of the specimens in 1930. The basically, interest was lost and, and kind of the thread was lost and 
and not until 1999, when the Union Chapel mine, a nearby mine in the same area, showed it had enormous potential for footprints and, and trackways. And in 2005, um, basically due to the grassroots efforts of amateurs, the area became the Stephen C. Minkin Paleozoic Footprint Site, and it's now protected for collecting from amateur by amateurs and professionals. Uh, so this this coal this carboniferous coal area in Alabama is essentially the southern end of an enormous swath of similar sediments that goes from here all the way up to Nova Scotia. And it outcrops in many, many areas and produces enormous amounts of fossils, but the, they're primarily plant fossils. Trackways are quite rare in that whole expanse. And the only place that might have a comparable variety and amount of uh, fossil footprints is Nova Scotia. And both of them claim to have probably include, they probably include the, the oldest reptile um, fossils in the world. So that's very exciting. So here's a quick look of some of the better specimens that were rescued from the crate. This is the, the scale in some of the pictures is this knife that's 11 and a half centimeters long. Um, this is a partial trackway of a tetrapod going in the toward the upper part of the screen. And it's a it's named Cinchosaurus cabi. A little bit about how footprints are named. It's very, very hard, if not usually impossible, to connect fossil footprints to their makers uh, in a specific level. So we have what's called a, a it's a separate taxonomy called ICNO taxonomy, ICNO meaning trace or trace fossil. So the everything has its own separate name that's only used for ICNO, tech, ICNO taxonomy and isn't really um, the same as for the animal fossils that we find. So this is Cinchosaurus cabi, one of the most common um, taxa from Alabama. This is another Cinchosaurus trackway going from the right to the left. Uh, and then the slab also includes these little marks that you see their little forked marks here on, on just scattered about on the surface, seemingly random. And when I first worked up this print, this picture, I put the question mark in front of the name Cufictium, which is, means it was a tentative identification. I was pretty sure that I was looking at Cufictium, but I didn't really know any of this stuff well enough. I don't work with tracks much. So it, uh, I, uh, for a little while, I wasn't sure what I was looking at, but we'll get back to that. Um, this is two footprints of an animal named, uh, or a trackway named Atenosaurus subulensis, and it's one of the larger tetrapods from the area. Um, <clears throat> down on the bottom here, you can see another trackway. This one's very faint. It might have been either uh, harder mud or it might be an under track of some sort. <clears throat> and this was exciting because when I was working up these photographs for the paper on this uh, discovery that came out last December, these were two separate prints. Um, but when you look at photographs long enough and, and repeatedly enough, they, they, you sometimes notice things after a long look. And I realized that these are actually part of the same trackway. And I put the pictures together in Photoshop and was very convinced that it was the same thing. And I did get a chance to go back um, and put the two actual slabs together and it is the same uh, slab, which was exciting. This piece down on the bottom left had a number written on it, a field number, but the top one had the, the number scratched off. So without uniting these, the, the data for the, the larger slab essentially would be, would be lost. <clears throat> and this is that slab that I showed you earlier on the flatbed cart um, with the cracks kind of pushed back together. And this is a, just a gorgeous trackway of Cinchosaurus cabi going from the left to the right. But by far my, my favorite slab is this one. This is the slab that you saw extending from one end of the crate to the other. It's about five feet long. The original description said four feet long, but it's, it's pretty much, it's about five. And it has one Cinchosaurus trackway going this over here and another one going through here. It's very hard to see from this photograph because the lighting was, was direct and side lighting is better for, for illuminating the tiny impressions of tracks on slabs. But in the original description, you can see here it says, specimen also carries two trails lengthwise showing one to two claw marks of some small animal. 
and they're here and here. And I know that's really hard to see. So, oops, I'm stuck again. Oh, there we go. <clears throat> This is this is with side lighting, so you can see the tracks a little better. This is one of the lines of tracks he's mentioning, and this is the second one. And this is a close-up, and you can see those little forked um, ends again. So if you remember, I was calling that earlier Kufichnium, and it's actually horseshoe crab tracks. Um, these were known to paleontologists for a really long time. They were first discussed in the 1860s and they were thought to be pterosaur tracks. And after that, they were everything from birds to mammals to dinosaurs to amphibians. They were always seen as tetrapod tracks. And they generally would have seen this set of tracks as going from the left side of the screen to the right side of the screen. It turns out it's a horseshoe crab going from the right side of the screen to the left side of the screen. And this trackway is exquisitely preserved because it's an under track. As I mentioned before, this is not the actual surface the horseshoe crab walked on, but it is the, the, the impressions of the feet piercing through the mud and maybe a millimeter or two under the surface. So it's actually much better preserved than a lot of the horseshoe crab tracks that, that come from the area. Um, and Simpson can be a, a excused for not recognizing this as a horseshoe crab trackway they were only first recognized as that about eight years after he was in um, Alabama. Uh, so this is a map of everything that I could see on the surface of that big slab. Uh, my One of our photographers took a really, really gigantic high-res photograph of the slab, the one that I showed earlier, and I zoomed in on Photoshop and traced everything I could see. And to avoid the pitfall of um, uh being distracted by the color variations in the surface i had this lab nearby and I, a flashlight and i would shine it sideways along the surface to make sure i was only preserving topographic features and not color features of this lab <clears throat> and that took me i think that drawing took me a few months a little bit of work every day it was very gratifying um and staring at something that long staring at trackways that long not only familiarizes one with the details of the kind of tracks that you're working with, but also the specific details of those actual tracks. Um, and you don't even realize that it's happening. I went back and looked at some of the other slabs and there was this little slab that had no number on it and didn't relate to any of the descriptions on the itemized list of Simpsons. Um, and I noticed that it has these little forked tracks on it. And I was like, oh, excellent. I have another Kufechnium trackway. These were quickly becoming my favorite fossils because I didn't know much about them and they were kind of intriguing. So I was thrilled that we had another one. But then I noticed this little mark right through the middle and it was familiar because it's the reverse of this mark. And it turned out that this slab, the small slab was actually part of the counter slab of the big piece. Um, remember I said that footprints come in mirrored pairs if, they, if they're split along the, the trackway surface. And this little piece all of a sudden regained all of its data because it was connected unambiguously to the big slab. It was very exciting. <clears throat> so then I remembered, wait a minute, we have other Kufechnium trackways. <clears throat> and I, that slab I showed you before, by the time I saw this, the next time the question mark was gone. I am positive this, these marks and these little faint marks over here are all part of a Kufechnium trackway. So I was excited we had an, another example, but then I thought, wait a second, there's a Synchosaurus trackway running through here. The big slab has both of those things. And you guessed it, this is another piece of the counter slab, uh, of, the, the, of the giant slab. And I went to the, at that point, I went to the, the itemized list and I looked, they, they had very specific details about where in the mine these slabs came out of. And thankfully, the big slab and this smaller piece shared exactly the same uh, locality data. So that was good. If, if either of them differed, I couldn't trust either of them. So that was, that was encouraging. And then while looking at the itemized list, I thought, wait a second, maybe there's something else from that area of the mine and I need to look at that. And sure enough, this piece on the right, um, we looked at earlier, 
this was from exactly the same place in the mine, and it's yet another piece of the counter slab. So we had three pieces rescued of the counter slab and, and reunited. <clears throat> in, in working up the paper that came out in December, I wanted to make sure I was as, as tight with my identifications as I could be. I knew we had Kufechnium, but I wanted to see if I could not just have the Ichno genus, but the Ichno species. So I knew that one horseshoe crab was described in 1930 from these mines, and it was called Bipedes aspidon, later updated to Cufichnium aspidon. So I wondered if I had, if I could say Cufichnium aspidon in the paper. And in the original 1930 paper, they had a picture of this slab, but it was a close-up. It was only showing basically these little forked uh, marks of a horseshoe crab. There's very little on the slab, but it was a close-up. And I took notice of this mark running right through the middle. And yes, this is a fourth piece of the counter slab and the most thrilling of all of them because, uh, well, I'll get to that in a second. I immediately contacted the Alabama Museum of Natural History where this specimen lives. And I asked them for a shot of the entire slab, which they provided. And mm -hmm. thankfully it um, doesn't overlap my other counter slab pieces. So this is the first unnumbered piece that we, we show, I showed you. This is, uh, these two are the, the numbered ones rescued from the crate. And the one on the top here is the holotype slab for bipedes aspidon. And you can see it has very, very little of the trackway preserved on it. Um, one thing about type specimens or holotypes, uh, only what's described in the holotype publication can be considered the holotype. So if later on you find more of the same animal, or in this case, more of the same trackway, it's not the holotype. It can be called made by or part of this, the holotype animal, but it's it's a separate type of thing. So two things were discovered with this, this um, relationship. One is that this is indeed part of the counter slab of our giant piece, but what's more important is our slab preserves a whole lot more of the trackway of the, the same animal that made the holotype. So it's, it has more information and uh, hopefully somebody will work on that in the future. I'm very excited about that. <clears throat> and just to remind you, the first, the, the top is the photograph and the bottom is the map. And you can see how much more detail can be made um, very clear in a, in a, um, a map uh, of this detail. <clears throat> so, when this slab was getting ready for being photographed to be photographed it was on a cart in the lab and dr mark norell our curator walked by and he saw it and he asked me is this that alabama stuff you've been playing with and i said yeah and he goes go in my old office under the sink and i think there's more of this material in there and that was a really weird thing to hear because he doesn't work on footprints. He doesn't work on these type of animals. He doesn't work on this time period. And he had vacated that office 20 years ago. So of course I went immediately up there and opened up under the sink and found these two slabs, which was really exciting. And they quickly uh, earned the name, the under the Cinchosaurus uh, in homage to Cinchosaurus, the most common taxon from Alabama. And they don't have any uh numbers written on them they didn't have any data connected to them they were just rocks with footprints on them but everything about them suggests that they came from the same mines um, as the material in the simpson crate this slab here has one and two uh synchosaurus tracks on it and this slab has what's named quadrupedia prima a trackway running this way and trisaurus secundus a second trackway running this way most people who work with these tracks today think that both of these are just preservational variants of Cinchosaurus cabi, so that's what we're probably looking at. Um, unfortunately, they, they're still a bit of a mystery. I tried to figure out what their backstory was. They don't seem to be related to the contents of the crate in any way. They don't match the description of any of the slabs that I was missing. Uh, but I did find, or the archivist, I give her credit, found this one accession record that might have something to do with it. The crate itself seems to have arrived at the museum on the 26th of March, 1931, or was shipped to the museum. And it had part of the 14 specimens li listed in the itemized list, most of them. 
the accession record is from a later date, so probably is not related to the crate itself. It mentions two slabs of fossil tracks, which is what I found under the sink. And it comes from the exact same place as the material in the, the crate, the mystery, the pre previous mystery crate. So could these be the under the synchrosaurs? They sure could, but there's probably no way with just this information to ever link them. The lack of information connected to the actual stones and this poor description of what they were leaves this a, a little open mystery that maybe one day we can wrap up. Um, so there's another little side trip we have to take to the P Pink Palace Museum in Memphis, Tennessee. Ron Buda was one of the authors of Footprints in Stone. And when he was researching the book, he knew he had come across the story that Simpson had come down to Alabama to collect fossils for the AMH. So he contacted us and asked us about the crate and the contents and were any papers written, were any put on display, like what's the story? And we didn't make the connection at that point, sadly. I had already opened the crate, but we we lost the the chance at that point because we were uh, rerouted onto other things. And um, I could have been giving this talk several years ago, I think. But Ron also knew that before the material was to go to New York, it had gone to Memphis first to the, what's now the Pink Palace Museum. So he contacted them and asked if they knew anything about it. Maybe the material never left uh, the South and was still in their collections. And they told him, oops, they said, yeah, we have some slabs of that material. And they had these two very, very large slabs. You can see the, the rubber glove on the left for scale. And they were likely acquired from the Alabama Museum of Natural History in 1932 as part of a trade. They were displayed unprotected outside the museum mansion doors and eventually put into dead basement storage before 1969 after they were vandalized. Being outside and unprotected, they were all full of scratches, of people's names and, and symbols and things. Um, Ron went to see the slabs in 2012 and was oddly offered both of them. And this is weird because museums don't tend to offer their specimens. They tend to keep them forever. Um, so after Ron and I um, started corresponding and, and working on the story of these crates, I asked the people in the uh, Pink Palace Museum if these were still available. And they said, sure. So they came to New York and they're, they're now part of the AM and H collections. So this is a really complicated story and it's i'm sure it's not over yet you can see like we have the crate and then we have the two under the synchrosaur specimens and then we have the two pink palace specimens and those were just um bonuses that that came through these the investigation and it's it's very it's an awful lot of work it's fun but it's a lot of work to get these stories correct and and pull all the loose details together um so i'm going to leave you with a, a story of the opposite end of that, where accuracy is not as important as sensationalism. Oh, sorry, I can't give you a quick look at the two slabs before we go there. This is uh, one of the slabs, and you can see there's a, a little bit of a Synchosaurus cowboy trackway on the bottom here. And this is the other slab right through the middle here is um, it's blown up on the left, and that's probably another Cufficnium trackway, and you can see all the incredible amount of scratches on the surface from vandalism. And then on the bottom here is another trackway that is was made in very, very sloppy mud, so it's not clear what it was. It's probably a tetrapod, but you can't even tell if it was going right to left or left to right. So anyway, here we go. Um, this is a newspaper from Utah in 1930 announcing the discovery of these footprints in Alabama. And it's one of the worst pieces of science journalism I have in my collection of such things. And the headline is fossilized record of the first heavyweight battle found in Alabama. Um, and I'm just going to take you through a couple of the, the, the worst problems with the paper or the, the, the article. 
This caption says, the skull of a prehistoric monster of the Megalosaurus family, also found near the Galloway coal mine number 11, believed to have been one of the amphibians that left marks of a death struggle in the rock. The jaw measures a foot and a half in length and contains huge sharp teeth. The truth is, this is a photo of a rhino skull. The member of the Megalosaurus family closest in time and space is from 157 million years later and over 1,100 miles away. No skull was ever found near the mine. Neither rhinos, megalosaurs, nor the track makers shown were amphibians, and rhinos don't have sharp teeth. Another section says, the other footprints have been identified as having been made by the gigant a gigantic beast of the Polycanthus family, which stood 25 feet in height, was armored like a rhinoceros, and had a five-clawed foot 14 inches long, stretching his body and tail to a height far taller than a modern giraffe. The truth is, the member of the Polycanthus family closest in time and space was from 165 million years later and over 1,200 miles away. The largest was under 20 feet long and no more than 5 feet in height. Giraffes reach 19 feet in height. And rhinos are not armored. Polycanthus had no horns and <clears throat> had smaller feet with fewer toes and hooves rather than claws. And then scattered throughout the article are things like this. Indelible record of a mighty battle, engaged in a death combat, intensely ferocious fight, grappling toe to toe and head to head for a death hold, appalling struggle, battle of the ages. In that battle, the two animals must have clawed and torn each other to pieces because to fail in such a fight was to die. The truth is, none of the tracks show any interaction between the track makers, and all were walking, not even running. This is the picture they included in the newspaper. It's a couple of dragons fighting, essentially. These are modern drawings of the two animals they said were involved. That's Megalosaurus at the top and Polycanthus at the bottom. And this is what one of the track makers actually looked like. And it's not to scale because the animal on the right is much, much, much smaller than the two dinosaurs to its left. Um, it's a Tenosaurus subulensis, the largest track maker from the mine thus identified at that point and looked to the untrained eye just like a lizard and was about three feet long. So please, when you read science in the newspaper, beware of sensationalism. Um, it's very easy for newspapers to want to sell papers and not, you know, teach science. That's not their job. So with that, I will thank all these lovely people and take questions. How do I do that? I can't escape. Yeah, you can stop sharing when, oh, whenever you can figure it out. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you can pull up the Google Doc with the questions. You've got That's questions in, so far. It's in my email, right? I will send you the link. But yes, I have it here. I just put it in the chat for you. You're going to have to copy and paste it, not just click it. I clicked the one in my email. Does that work too? Yeah, that works too. Okay. Okay. How old are the horseshoe crab tracks is the first question. Um, they are, all this, the trackways from this deposit are about 320 million years old. Um, I, I know, I'm pretty sure there are older horseshoe crab tracks, um, but because horseshoe crabs have been around for hundreds of millions of years, their tracks are, are known basically for that whole time period. Um, what kind of collections does the Pink Palace Museum have? I don't actually know. Um, I think they don't, it's not really focused on natural history that much. I think if I remember right, it's a lot more historical material and that might be one of the reasons they weren't interested in holding on to the, the two slabs that we got from them. Um, I do plan on visiting one day when I when I get myself to the south, but right now it's it's a, it's another mystery to me. Um, the next question: How can you tell if the track maker was walking or running? Um, basically, so the way I don't I don't do this kind of work, but from what I gather, um, it's all about measuring the tracks, and if you it's measuring the distance between tracks, I should say. Um, you can tell from a good set of footprints, basically 
um, the hip height of the animal and therefore the leg, the, the length of the legs. And based on that, a, a certain uh, distance will um, indicate that it was walking and, and anything beyond that is trotting or, or, or running. So it's, it, I don't know if I'm explaining that right, but it has to do with the, the way the tracks are laid out on the ground and the order they're in. Um, the next question is, how did you get interested in paleontology? Um, I don't see that there was any choice for me. Um, I was into paleo uh, at least since I was five. Um, I think it's really easy because it's really romantic and really exciting. Um, I, I'm, as a five-year-old, I don't think I was paying attention to how I was learning things. I just fell into it and, and never fell out of it, thankfully. Do you have a favorite prehistoric creature? <clears throat> that changes all the time. When I was working on the contents of the crate, horseshoe crabs were my favorite for quite a, a time. I don't think I have one that I love all the time because it's just all so interesting to me. Um, I flit about a lot. I don't, I, I can't rest on one thing <laughs> for better or worse. Um, what's your favorite place you have traveled to look for fossils? This is, this is a, a lot like the last question. I, overall, my, my long-term favorite is the Cretaceous fossils that you find in New Jersey, but I've collected fossils all over the world. And one place that I'm desperate to get back to is actually Texas. They have, in Texas and Oklahoma, they have wonderful Permian fossils, which is, what is that, about 260 million years old, I think. And so Demetrodon, the, the sail-backed uh, early relative of mammals is, is very common there. It's a, an iconic animal that probably a lot of you know, and a lot of uh, other related amphibians and giant sharks and, and, and things like that. So I'm, that's high on my list for the near future, at least. The next question, can you give any advice for someone interested in starting a career in paleo? I can. I can tell you what I did, and I can also tell you that it's very, very, very different than when I started um, because of the internet and the, the options that, that you have now. Um, in a general sense, read, 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 um, and, and familiarize yourself with not just the the tighter area of paleontology you might be interested in, but all the things that might be connected to that. And the, I think the most important thing that I did, at least with respect to getting where I am in, in, the, in this science, was volunteering. I, luckily, I, work, I live in New York City, so I got this giant museum behind me uh, that has an, a really great paleontology program and takes a lot of volunteers. But that was by far the most significant thing that I did to, to advance my career. Because from the outside, you may picture paleontology a certain way. And you know you see people going out to dig things up and then writing papers about them. And that is an aspect of it. But not until I volunteered that I recognized that there were the support staff, the ones that um, extract the fossils from the rock and the people who curate the collections and and, and and take care of them as a librarian would. So that's when I learned about what I could do in, in my future. And that's when I decided to be a caretaker of collections. Um, next question is, are there any notable track sites in the New York, New Jersey area? There's one dinosaur track site in New York State, one, and it's in Nyack and it's really small and I don't think you'll ever find anything there because they're really, really rare. But there are a lot of sites in New Jersey. I've been to maybe only one of them. I haven't really explored that, but there are a lot of early Jurassic dinosaur track sites in Jersey. Um, I don't know um, about the legality of collecting in them. Um, they're, they tend to be protected and, and pretty small, but they're, they're, there's a really good record for New Jersey. What's the oldest reptile fossil in the world? Um, if you remember, I, I was mentioning that um, both Nova Scotia and these uh, areas in the coal mines in Alabama have probably the oldest reptiles in the world. Um, its age is probably around 320, maybe just a little bit older than that. Um, 
there are footprints in Alabama, but Nova Scotia has not only footprints, but the skeletons of the animals as well. So that's really exciting. They have more of the story up there. Um, next question is, the Rutgers Geology Museum has growlitter tracks. Do you know what kind of dinosaur, um, sorry, would that refer to? Um, they are definitely theropods, which means they're the three-toed meat-eating dinosaurs. And based on their age, they're probably, as it, uh, as it says here, they're probably um, coelophysis or something very, very close to that. Remember I said earlier, it's usually impossible to connect the footprint to the actual species that made it. So based on the animals of that time that we know, coelophysis is the best guess, or at least, you know, a relative of coelophysis. <clears throat> Next question is, what's your favorite exhibit at the AM and H? <sighs> Any of those, what's your favorite questions I have a hard time with, because I, I love so many things. Probably the one that I consistently go back to is the mummy of the the hadrosaur that we have on the fourth floor. It's just exquisite. It's covered on most of what's preserved with the most beautiful skin impressions and wrinkles. And it's, to me, way more evocative than a skeleton. You see a dead animal there and you, you kind of uh, empathize with it if, if you want to think of it that way. But also, Bones are very easy to preserve, so seeing soft tissue is always exciting because it's rarer in the fossil record, and this is a, an extraordinary example of that. Um, what am I currently working on at the museum? Um, because of COVID, I haven't been at the museum anywhere near as often as, as I had, so a lot of the work I'm able to do now is data related. Um, I, organizing the information that's connected to the specimens and making that um, more useful for researchers is generally what I'm doing. Um, we don't have any uh, research visitors at the moment, which is would take up a lot of my time normally, and we don't, we're not doing any loans, so we're able to get to a lot of the projects that have been sitting around for a long time, much like opening this crate from 1930. Hopefully I'll get to do some more of that. Uh, what time period exactly in years before now were the horseshoe crab tracks from? The time period they're from, the ones that I talked about, is Carboniferous. So, um, in specific, the Pennsylvanian period within the Carboniferous, and th that was about 320 million years ago. <clears throat> what time were the horseshoe crab? What time were the horseshoe crab tracks from in years before now? So it's basically the same question. Um, Whoa, there's a lot of questions. <laughs> um, other than the horseshoe crab, what kind of animals make under tracks? Essentially anything walking on the right kind of sediment can make under tracks. And the feet don't even need to pierce the sediment necessarily to leave under tracks. They just have to deform the sediments underneath them. So if you imagine a layer cake is the, the general example, and cake is squishy enough for this example to work really well. If you push your hand into the top of a layer cake, you will leave a handprint in the top, but you're also deforming the layers deeper in the cake. And if they hold that shape, they're under tracks of your handprint, and the sediment works much the same way. <clears throat> you may have already mentioned this, but what kind of rocks are the fossil slabs? What are you comparing? with the last few slides, what were you comparing? I'm not sure I followed the, the second part of that, but the rocks themselves, it's a gray shale um, that in the mines themselves is interbedded with the coal seams, you know, and, and it's essentially, it's the, the coal miners that open this window into the footprints that we have. They're not interested in the shale. Um, they're interested in the coal between the layers of shale, but their digging exposes the shale and allows us uh, what erosion wouldn't provide us, which is pretty exciting. Um, next question is, how do you tell which way the tracks go? Do, the, do you have tracks that show the animal turned away or turned around? That happens sometimes. I know there's at least one trackway from Alabama that shows an animal walking 
and there's an obstacle in its way and it turns around the obstacle. It's not clear what the thing is, but the trackway obviously avoids that. Those aren't uncommon, but but always exciting. Telling which way the tracks goes depends on what the animal is. With the tetrapods, if they're good tracks, it's very, very easy to tell because the toes point forward and give you the direction of movement. But as I mentioned with the Kufichnium trackways, the, the horseshoe crab tracks, unless you know it's a horseshoe crab, you're, you may misinterpret which direction it's walking in. So when it was seen as the footprints of a tetrapod, it made more sense that the forks were pointing in the direction of movement when they're actually pointing the other way. So it can be difficult if you don't have good tracks or you don't know what animal is being represented. Um, how do you know these are not just chicken footprints? Well, they're in stone, first of all, which is hard for a chicken to do. And this is mm, hundreds of years older than the oldest chicken. So based on geology and sub material, um, there's basically no way they're chickens. What's your biggest fossil? I'm, I'm guessing you're meaning what the AM and H's biggest fossil is. Um, and this can be understood in different ways. In terms of weight, one of the biggest fossils we have is actually a trackway on display on the fourth floor behind our big apatosaurus skeleton. And that's 20 tons, this one fossil, you could say. It's just one trackway of, uh, well, it's two trackways of, of two different dinosaurs, but it's one slab. So that's probably the heaviest specimen we have. Um, biggest? Oof maybe in terms of volume or or length it could be uh one of the big sauropods like the like we have um up next to that trackway actually it's about 90 feet long i think it is a composite so it's not all one animal so that complicates uh, uh the assigning it that way the titanosaur that we have is a cast so i can't call it a fossil it's significantly bigger but it it is a facsimile of a much bigger fossil, we'll say. Could you provide the correct spelling for Synchosaurus? Yes. Yeah, I guess I didn't have it on any of this, or maybe just one of the slides. It's C-I-N-C-O-S-A-U-R-S. -S. Um, are the horseshoe crab track slabs on exhibit? Sadly, no. Um, they That was the original intent in the 30s, and since then curatorial focus has gone in so many directions there's no no interest in in doing that at the moment i was hoping there would be a way to get it into the new exhibits in the new building we're going to open in a year or so but um it doesn't fit in with the story that's being told there so at least for now they're they're just in storage um for researchers and i believe i'm on the last question are oh another one's coming up as i say that are fossil trackways more or less susceptible to being destroyed over time than animal fossils? I guess you mean bone fossils. Um, it depends. If they're protected by their overlying sediments, they can last indefinitely. Once they're exposed on the surface, depending on the type of rock it's in, they can get destroyed, weathered very, very quickly. It, it really depends on the type of minerals that have preserved it and the type of environment it's exposed in. But generally tracks don't do well on the surface for very long. Um, and the next question, maybe the last, how many specimens do you have in storage? Approximately. Thank you for the approximately. Um, I have cataloged about 33,000 specimens in the portion of the collection I take care of, which is fossil amphibians, reptiles, and birds. Um, I have a lot more that aren't cataloged. And if I just had to guess with respect to the, the ones that I'm actually in charge of, I would say we probably have 100,000 specimens in my end of the collection, depending on how you define what a specimen is. Um, so that's, it's a lot. It's a lot to work with, but it's really, really fun. Um, I think that's it. Um, okay. I think we made it. We made it. Thank you so much. That was a fascinating look, not only into trackways, but also into paleo detective work. Thank you. So thank thank you. you very much. I'm sure our audience joins me in thanking you for that great talk. And uh, 
look forward to hearing more about your work in the future. Thank you, guys. Take care. All right, we'll be returning for our next talk at one o'clock. I hope you'll all um, stay on and join us for that. And maybe in between, you can check out our mineral sale. Thank you.